I would like to explain what this research about developing the new tool for an inclusive and deliberative um, elaboration and evaluation of policies um, has been about and, and describe why it constitutes, in my view, a major step forward building on the superb research of Oxford University and ATD Fourth World called The Hidden Dimensions of Poverty. We made, I believe, four shifts. The first one was expected, anticipated, and the three others took us by surprise. The first shift is very simple. We wanted to develop a tool to allow impact assessments to better incorporate the hidden dimensions of poverty, which beyond lack of income, lack of decent work, material deprivation, were usually underestimated in the macroeconomic uh, studies, the human rights impact assessments even, that uh, are meant to assess the impact on poverty and inequality of certain policy choices. And we took as departure points this um, research, the hidden dimensions of poverty and those dimensions that were usually underestimated, asking how we could ensure that while we design new policies or while we assess their impacts, those hidden dimensions, such as institutional um, uh, maltreatment, social maltreatment, um, shame, discrimination, could be better taken into account. That was the initial objective. And that is the shift we first tried to make. But then we went beyond. And we understood gradually that we needed to conceive of participation, not simply as a way to extract knowledge, not simply as a way to better understand impacts, but as a way to empower. So that decision-making looks more like research. We do not know what is the good solution. We are agnostic about what the good solution will look like. And we build those solutions with people in poverty, with practitioners, social workers, public servants, NGOs, in order to um, sometimes take the, the scientists, the researchers by surprise. And there is in human rights law a right to participation. Um, my predecessor, Magdalena Sepulveda Carmona, dedicated a full report to how to involve people in poverty in participatory processes. She did this 10 years ago. And the report is interesting because it emphasizes two things. First, participation is not simply a means to an end, a way to better design and implement policy reduction strategies. It's also an end in itself insofar as it allows empowerment. It is, of course, a means to an end, and um, it allows us to understand the concrete obstacles that people in poverty face. For example, why do they not claim the benefits they have a right to? Might it have to do with the traumatizing experience they've had with certain social services? May it have something to do with the shame they experience when they queue to receive something from, from food banks? Is it perhaps the um, fear of stigma, discrimination, that explains why they don't claim their rights? We can understand better how interventions succeed or fail by involving people in poverty, and insofar as we do that, participation is a means to improve how we uh, make choices. But it's also an end in itself. It empowers, it raises awareness about rights. People who participate, they are emboldened to hold decision makers accountable. The service provider becomes a duty bearer and people benefiting from the service become rights holders. Social capital is built within the community, establishing trust also between administrators and the public. And that happens once participation is not only about providing information, consulting with people, involving them at a very late stage, but co-constructing the question with them and identifying with them what the most interesting solutions may look like. The third shift 
is that we gradually understood that the key problem was how we conceived of incentives and what made people behave the way they do. Um, we have, for many years, been working with the assumption that people are rational decision makers. Remember the rational choice model. You provide the right incentives, the right set of taxes and subsidies, uh, the right legal regulations, and you get people to act as you would like them to act. Now, few people still believe in that initial model. And the great work of Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo, Michael Kramer, um, Richard Thaler, and of course, building on the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky was precisely to show that we are not rational beings, that incentives were not the whole thing, that people were acting with the bounded rationality based on social norms, on routines, on heuristic biases and emotions. And so we've been improving economics thanks to the work of those pioneers whom I mentioned. But now we must move one step further. Not only is it not sufficient to create the right incentives and the hope that people will act rationally, it is also not sufficient to test through randomized controlled trials what will work or what will not work. Um, we must go beyond that, providing space for people with an experience in poverty to express their views, moving towards an empowering economics, not just an empirical economics. That means working with people to co-construct solutions, acting not only for the community, but also through the community, because they have knowledge we simply can't afford the luxury to ignore. And yes, it's time-consuming. Yes, it requires some modesty. Yes, it can look costly in the beginning, but the rewards are huge if we do this properly both because we will avoid making mistakes and because we will make people uh, agents uh, better equipped to claim their rights. And you see the shift is from treating people as passive beneficiaries of solutions and asking how we can influence them from the outside to um, seeking them, seeing them as active, as um, involved in shaping decisions so that they are intrinsically motivated to do certain things. And there we come to the fourth and final shift, and I close with this. The research that led to this tool being presented today is also about reinventing democracy. Uh, not simply must we ensure that governments function properly, that people go to vote, um, and that... <laughs> decision makers act according to the rule of law, we also must democratize society by having more um, instances where people participate, even at the local level, in making the decisions that affect them. And let me refer in closing to another Economics Nobel Prize laureate, another woman, Elinor Ostrom, who, who in her work on governing the commons, emphasized that communities were perfectly able to set their own rules, to decide their own governance principles, um, provided they were given the freedom to decide on those rules and trusted each other, building on this social capital that I've already referred to. Um, before she published Governing the Commons in 2009, um, sorry, before she was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2009, Elin um, Ostrom wrote an article in 2007 where she says this, simply enabling subjects to engage in face-to-face -face communication between decision grounds enables them to approach socially optimal harvesting levels rather than severely over-harvesting the commons, right? So this was a response to the, the tragedy of the commons um, um, of Garrett Hardin. In the face-to-face -face discussions, participants tend to discuss what they all should do and build norms to encourage conformance. And when she accepted the Nobel Prize in Economics and delivered her acceptance speech, she said, a core goal of public policy should be to facilitate the development of institutions that bring out the best in humans. Well, the ID tool is not simply an aid to decision makers. 
It's not simply to avoid com committing mistakes. It's a way to empower people so that they will better apply the norms that they have helped to shape, better understand the systems in which and with which they will operate, and will be able to be much better equipped to hold governments and service providers accountable. And this is why we believe this is only a first step towards something that is really going to be important, because if we take seriously the potential the huge and untapped potential of participation of people in poverty in shaping decisions, we will, I assure you, be much better in what we are doing. Thank you.